this will be a bit different than what you've heard in the first few talks, obviously, moving from, from you know, quantum chemistry to proteins, so bigger things. Um, and I think the emphasis will be a bit different as well in terms of what, um, what the take-home messages are and, and sort of the, the things we're trying to communicate. Uh, but, but I hope it'll still be, you know, it'll be interesting, but just in a different way. Um, so just by, by way of background, I'll get into this in a, in a moment, but um, so, you know, Alpha Fault 2 came out obviously a couple of years ago, that was a big deal. Um, and, and we've sort of launched this effort uh, for, for over a year now, uh, initially to kind of reproduce and, and re, you know, rebuild a, and retrain Alpha 2 from scratch, which hadn't been done. Um, and, and I think we've sort of gained a bunch of insights, and that, that's going to be kind of the bulk of the bulk of what I'll talk about uh, today. But that's, that's what the open fault sort of is at a high level. So the, the basic problem, you know, that, that we're focused on, at least for, for the, much of this talk, is, is this question of protein structure prediction, right? So, you know, if you have an amino acid sequence, let me see if I can get this to work. Uh, well, it's not working. Okay. Oh, it's the top one. Sorry. I'm going backwards. All right. Uh, there we go. Yeah. So if you have an amino acid sequence, you know, the question is, can you predict the final three-dimensional structure, right? Um, and this, this isn't really protein folding, so we're not trying to do anything dynamical here. We're just simply trying to give something that presumably resembles a native state um, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the protein, um, almost certainly in a, in a crystallographic form, right? So something that, that, that actually crystallizes. Um, and, and it's worth noting here that you know, this is part of a larger set of problems in molecular modeling, particularly in the, in the biomolecular space, right? in, in terms of you know, trying to predict things like protein-protein interactions, protein-nucleic acid interactions, um, where small molecules might dock into, into a binding pocket. You know, problems like that, which are sort of, I would say, I guess kind of more bioinformatic in nature, but they obviously had a great utility uh, from, the, from the kind of the biology, uh, the biology perspective. Um, so, all of this, I will say, sort of is, is now is now taking kind of place in 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 the in light or kind of in the context of Alpha Fold Two, uh, which really I think evolutionizes the the, the space. I, I think that's not uh, sort of hyperbolic, right? So you know, I'm showing on the left. These are sort of uh, historical kind of numbers from CAS, which is this biennial competition to predict protein structure, um, and then you see the RMSD, you know, just mean square deviation from the ground truth experimental structure and the predictions. And you know, historically, these, these methods were very poor, um, you know, up in the you know, 15 plus angstrom regime. And over the course of about four years, you know, we, went, we went from, from that regime down to now methods that are essentially you know, within striking distance of experimental, uh, experimental crystallographic structures. And, and you know, they look like this. Right? Where, where when you superpose the, the prediction with a ground to it, they almost look indistinguishable. And that's, I, I think, probably, the, I would argue, maybe has been the kind of most impressive demonstration of machine learning in the, in the physical sciences. Right? This is the one area where we, I think we can kind of definitively say this was a real problem and, it's, and, and there's been a, a very big dent made into solving it. Um, now, uh, just to summarize, so, so Alpha Fold 2 does you know, some things really well, uh, and, but it still struggles with some other things, right? So you know, if, you, if you think about protein complexes or individual proteins, um, the median accuracy, like I said, is on the order of two angstroms, and really the, the limitation there is just how, how big your GPU is, how much you could stuff into RAM. Um, Alpha Fold 2 scales cubically in, in the length of the protein, so, so, so that's, that's a bit of a limitation. Um, it does it still struggle a bit with multi-domain proteins or protein complexes. It's not perfect. It's not nearly as good as individual proteins. And it struggles quite a bit with things like mutations or single sequences. Right? So if you, if you want to understand how a mutation is going to impact the structure of a protein, alpha doesn't do very well in that regard. It, it can't really tell you that sort of information. Um, and it can't kind of... What's the, what's the single sequence? The, the single sequence is if you don't have, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll get into maybe the details later on, but if you don't, so the way it generally works is from a multiple sequence alignment, right? So you have a bunch of evolutionary related proteins and making a prediction based, based on this notion of covariation. But if you have an individual sequence, either because it's sort of an orphan, it happens to exist in the kind of twilight space of proteins, um, or uh, if you have, say, a protein design context where you're trying to generate kind of artificial proteins, uh, that's where, where it has, has more trouble. Um, and it, it certainly can't handle things right now that are sort of, you know, say more chemistry rather than biology. So you know, it can't handle things like modified amino acids. Uh, it doesn't really know anything about the environment. Uh, so this is kind of one example I often like to show. Uh, this one was one of the Cas14 prediction targets where uh, the crystallographic structure had a zinc ion bound and kind of stabilizing this, this, this site. Um, and the, the, you know, the irony is that Alpha got this prediction quite, quite well. So, right? so, so you can see the side chains are all in the right place. Um, but of course, it doesn't know anything about zinc ions. It doesn't know anything about you know, the environment. You, know, it, you can't tell it to change the ionic concentration and then give you a different structure. Right? So it's, it's quite sort of uh, blind to anything beyond just you know, the 20 amino acids, the 20 natural amino acids that happen to, to be in the, kind of the bulk of the PDB structures that it's been trained on. Um, so, so those are some of the, the, sort of the current limitations, right? Um, 
having said that, so, so CAS 15 just happened. This is the, 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 the kind of the next iteration after the, the one that was uh, that, that Alpha 2 debuted in. Um, and there's actually been quite a bit of progress since then, uh, primarily in complexes, how well you can predict uh, structures of complexes. These are all the methods and essentially kind of higher is better here. Uh, but, but the takeaway, the thing I want to kind of note is that, uh, you know, essentially all of the, you know, from here on up, all those methods were alpha-fold two-based, right? So, so uh, they took alpha-fold and then they typically kind of built on it in some various ways, usually to be perfectly frank, you know, fairly minor tweaks. Uh, and they sort of got it to work a little bit, a little bit better. This is kind of the baseline vanilla alpha-fold two. Um, otherwise, you know, essentially everything here is based on some version of AlphaFold. Uh, this is the Baker method, so this is the one that's actually different. Although it's, you know, it's still obviously inspired by the arch architecture, but it's a, you know, it's a different model. Um, the, there's been a fair bit of interest in trying, this doesn't work that well, uh, in trying to com combine um, um, protein language models. So the mo those are models that are trained on lots and lots of sequences in an unsupervised way, and coupling that to something like AlphaFold. Um, this method from, from uh, oh, maybe I'll just point, this method from, um, from uh, Facebook, the meta group, uh, which actually was built uh, using OpenFold, uh, debuted here. And so you can see it's sort of not quite as good yet as the kind of multiple sequence alignment methods. Um, but, but anyway, the, the, the takeaway is that it's really very dominant, right? And essentially everybody that's working in the space is, is tweaking our fold in one way or another to make it, to make it uh, work better. Um, now the one thing that I think has been missing and, and actually is largely missing from CAS 15 are sort of retrained versions of AlphaFold. So, so essentially all of these methods, by and large, they take the, the model as it were, and then they kind of add various augmentations, but it's the same weight, it's the same kind of core, core model that, that literally was trained by DeepMind and just kind of reused in, in, in sort of new contexts, right? Um, and, and I'll come back to why that's significant in, in, in a moment, um, but with one last bit of sort of background before I get into the new stuff, so one, one, I think, key feature of AlphaFold, which I think made it much more broadly useful by the, by the community, much more broadly useful to the community, was the fact that the predictions are calibrated, right? So, so it has its own metric, uh, what, what's called the, oops, sorry, what's called the PLDDT at the bottom uh, here. And that metric is essentially an assessment uh, by AlphaFold of the likely accuracy of, of its prediction, right? Uh, relative to here now on the y-axis, the actual accuracy, you know, again, measured by, by comparing to the, the crystallographic structure, and you see that they're generally well, well correlated, right? And that made it just much more useful because you could take a look at structure, and this is a per residue metric, so you could look at individual residues and say, oh, well, the blue ones are highly, highly accurate, the model thinks they're accurate, and the stuff in yellow and orange is much more kind of suspicious, right? And that, that just made it kind of much more readily uh, useful. Um, and in particular, what that allows one to do as well is, is, is ask questions like, okay, if we look at the human proteome, and now they made predictions for essentially, you know, all known proteins that, that, that we have in, in uh, protein databases. But if you look at, say, increased coverage of the human proteome, you know, what fraction of that coverage is a sort of various levels of, of confidence? And that, again, gives us some, some <laughs> confidence in, in sort of how well we could use this data. Uh, and, and in particular, if you're trying to make certain you know, insights about what does the structure mean to you, or you know, what kind of mechanism is involved for, for, say, for a given enzyme, uh, having that accuracy or having that sort of self-reported accuracy is really very helpful. Okay, so, so, so that's sort of just by way of background. Um, so, so now let me kind of explain a little bit as to, as to why we, we did this open all effort and what, what we've learned from it. Uh, so we started out with, I would say, kind of four initial motivations that really drove, drove the, the work. Um, first was full scale retraining. So, so AlphaFold, uh, or rather DeepMind, when they released the, the, they released the code base for AlphaFold, did not include a training code, right? So, so you couldn't just take the model or take the code base and then start from scratch and train a fresh, a fresh new model. And I'll, I'll mention why that's, why that's relevant or important in a moment. Um, the other was to kind of modularize the system, right? So if we wanted to kind of break it up into to various components so that people can mix and match and develop new models using the kind of the, the, the basic principles that, that were sort of present in, in, the, in the model. Um, the third, and I think, end up being the most interesting, and is, is what I'm going to focus on for the most of the talk, is, is a sort of knowledge acquisition. Right? So we we've actually learned a whole bunch of new things about, about AlphaFold by retraining it. Um, and you know, partly kind of going back to the theme of the, of the, of the workshop about emergence, um, you know, there were some sort of interesting emergent properties about the way it's learned. And, and I do wonder how much of that is sort of general, how much of that can transfer to, to other molecular modeling problems. Um, I'll come back uh, to that again later on. Um, and then finally, the last motivation was very practical, which was that the initial release of AlphaFold, uh, the, the, the model weights were not, um, were not permissive for commercial use. So all, from, all the pharmaceuticals were actually locked out of using uh, AlphaFold, and, and there was a, a period of a few months where there was kind of a lot of frustration on the industry side because people just couldn't use, use it to make any predictions. 
Um, DeepMind changed tack and eventually uh, released uh, or um, uh, changed the license so that it became permissive. And so that, that, that particular motivation kind of ceased to be relevant. Uh, but that was actually, I mean, to be perfectly transparent, that was kind of one of the, the reasons because we thought we'll just retrain it and then release it publicly and then everybody could use it without having to worry about this. Um, but so come, but coming back to the top three, let, let me kind of just uh, slightly sort of uh, flesh out why, why uh, we, we went uh, through them. So, so very quickly after Alpha 2 came out, and quickly I mean like weeks, um, people started thinking about ways of, of sort of retooling it for complex prediction, for predicting protein-protein interactions instead of just individual proteins. Um, and the basic insight made by a couple of people over Twitter, of all places, uh, was that you could just simply take two proteins, essentially link them by, by a flexible link, like, like glycine linker, and then feed them in silico into the, into the model, and then lo and behold, you can actually get the complex out, right? Uh, which, is, which is pretty cool, you know, very, very simple. No retraining, nothing, I just take the exact same model. Um, and I think, in, in a way, to me, this was quite shocking, because it, it really spoke to the, to the generalizability of the model, right? The fact that it was only trained on single proteins, but was able to actually sort of kind of um, generalize this entirely new context, right, was quite impressive. And it's not something you typically see in a, in a machine learning model that's able to kind of go into a whole new, a whole new regime. Um, and this was pretty quickly applied by various groups, including David Baker's group, to sort of add to organisms uh, where, where this was sort of possible to do at a large scale. So they recovered here kind of the core eukaryotic machinery from, from yeast. Um, and there have been applications to humans, although a little bit less successful. Um, but so, 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 so that was, you know, that was very exciting. That happened very quickly. But one, one kind of interesting thing here is, um, is the following. So uh, what I'm showing here, and this is actually from the paper that DeepMind uh, published on, on this multimer version uh, that, that I'll talk about in a second. But um, prior to alpha fold 2, essentially the state of the art was this green model. Right? So this is for protein-protein complex prediction, how well you can recover the structure. Um, and then these various bars, the ones that are uh, in kind of the bottom five, those are all what I kind of just talked about earlier, right? So they're taking the, the, the trained model and they're just kind of tweaking it in various ways by essentially giving it uh, linked proteins. Um, this is how well they do. So higher is, is better here on this DOCQ score. Uh, and so you see, you know, immediately we kind of, you know, they went beyond the state of the art. Um, but, uh, but, but none of these involved any kind of retraining of the model. This paper, the one I'm, I'm citing here, Alfold Multimer, uh, was essentially taking the exact same architecture, uh, and the, this is done by DeepMind, and just simply retraining the model now on protein-protein complexes instead of just individual apoproteins, right? And, and why, why I mention this is because, you know, immediately there's a large, large, large gain, right? So this was kind of notable because they didn't do anything kind of interesting architecturally, uh, but they just simply retrained the model, and that retraining really gave them a, a, a big leap, right? Um, and I think it's, it's, it sort of motivates the, the whole, the, the, you know, what I'm describing here in this open fall because uh, one of the key things that we want to do with OpenFold is, is release a trainable version that, that people can go and retain from scratch if they have enough compute. Um, and, 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 and this kind of demonstrates the value of that. Incidentally, at CAS15, DeepMind didn't participate. This is the one just, that just happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, and like I said, essentially all the, all the various groups did not retain AlphaFold. They just took it as it were and they just kind of tweaked it in various ways. Um, and, it was, and, and, and they saw some gains. But DeepMind did in fact go and retrain alpha multiply this one on more data and essentially just kind of bigger proteins. Um, and even though they didn't participate, they sort of unofficially at least claimed that the, that the new retrained version uh, was as good as the best new submission at CAS 15, right? Um, so this was kind of again, another, another round of this where you know, a bunch of people did a bunch of clever things and you know, they got some gains. And then DeepMind just didn't do anything, just, well, didn't do it, just retrained the model from scratch, uh, but on a larger data set, and then saw similar gains. Right? So again, I can speak to the value of being able to do this um, at, a, at a larger and sort of bigger scale. So that was, that's one, one key thing. Um, the other is this kind of modularity aspect, right? So um, I'm not going to go into the alpha to architecture. There are lots of moving pieces. Uh, but suffice it to say, there are certain components, like the, you know, these kind of various period and material presentations, or the structure module, uh, that are quite useful because they, they sort of generalize uh, neural primitives like attention, for example, which is sort of all the, all the age in, in these kinds of models, uh, to, to the molecular context, right? In this case, by sort of um, imbuing attention with kind of various geometric uh, characteristics, uh, not really priors, but just characteristics, uh, this notion of a sort of a triangular attention update. Um, and so these are kind of generally useful primitives, right? Uh, and if you look, in fact, at the, at the, at the literature in the space since then, you know, there have been many applications, for example, in RNA structure prediction, where people have reused alpha 2 components for this purpose, right? 
similarly for like invoice folding uh, or, or refinement of structure, you see some of these sort of triangular attention kind of pieces again being used um, uh, for protein design and so on. So um, we thought that sort of again kind of democratizing this, modularizing this would be useful to allow people to kind of build and, and mix and match uh, those components to, to, to derive new architectures. And I think we're seeing that over and over again. I mentioned that the ESM fold, which was uh, Facebook's uh, version of AlphaFold built with protein language models, that was that the, the code base for that is essentially uh, OpenFold. Okay, so now I'm going to get into kind of the heart, uh, the heart of the matter, which is, which is um, both kind of producing the results because we thought that's valuable, right? actually being able to show that what was described in the paper is sufficient to, to, give, to, give, a model, uh, to give a model from scratch, um, and then some of the things we've learned um, by, by way of doing so. So, so let me just start out by showing how well it does work, which, which is that it works quite well. So um, this is kind of a scatter plot showing OpenFold versus AlphaFold. So this is a completely freshly retrained version of, of I guess, of OpenFold from, from just from the PDB uh, on a held data set, and essentially you know, they're, they're, they're equivalent. Um, and, right, and here you see so superposition between the, the white is the ground truth structure, the blue is, is uh, AlphaFold, and the pink is OpenFold, and they're essentially all uh, giving the exact same answer. Um, the, so yeah. Can I go back? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. There are a couple of outliers. Yes. Uh, do you know why? So there's always outliers because even even with 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 AlphaFold, it's an ensemble sort of approach. Ah, so they, okay. they make a bunch of predictions, and, and we, we have a bunch not made uh, well. They make a, they train a bunch of models, which gives you a bunch of predictions. And similarly for us, so there's always some stochasticity. Yeah, uh, but one is like very small. This is really in the corner, that so one. it's very uh, yes, yeah, very poor here. This is actually one way we do well, uh, incidentally, because OpenFold predicts it well. The uh, seven D U S, and and this one's the opposite. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, we can kind of speculate a little bit as to what makes some predictions work well or not. So part of what happens in, in, in the artful architecture is that sort of implicitly samples alternate, you know, confirmations as making its predictions. And, and, and I think it's fair to say that it does kind of get stuck sometimes. And, and that's, that's what you see in those cases where it essentially gets stuck in a, in a bad local minima. Um, it, it does do something like implicit sampling. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so, so uh, just in terms of how well it works, we, we also actually improve some of the inverse characteristics. Um, so, so, for example, you know, for, at least for so much short proteins, it's about three times faster, uh, our implementation in alpha, which, which, is, which is not insignificant. Um, and, and we sort of uh, made it more memory efficient by, by re-implementing the attention mechanism to be more memory efficient, so we can get to much larger GPUs, uh, sorry, <laughs> much larger proteins on, on mortal GPUs and, and larger complexes. Um, and and this, this is incidentally applicable to, to the DeepMind weight. So, so you could take the DeepMind weights and just kind of plug them into OpenFold, and, and, and that works. So they're actually compatible, uh, even though it's a completely different implementation. Um, and, and, and right, so there's essentially kind of a trade-off between memory and speed, where you could where you could wait longer but get larger complexes and so on uh, by 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 shuttling between CPU and GPU memory. Um, let, let me skip some of these details. Um, okay, yeah, I'll skip some of this very technical stuff. Um, but suffice it to say, you know, we, we sort of made this work in a, in a I, I would argue, in a more um, commodified way. So you could run it on, on kind of standard GPUs that you can have in an academic cluster instead of sort of requiring kind of more high-end GPUs that maybe you wouldn't have access to. Um, okay, so, so let me kind of now get into some of the things we, we, we've begun to learn. So um, first is, is how is this convergence characteristics, right? So what's interesting here is that it seems to actually learn rather quickly, right? Um, so... We trained it for about 80 days on 44 GPUs, um, but already in the first couple of days, in two, three days, you see about 90% of the performance is recovered, right? So that's really important, because if you're trying to train a model, um, if you're trying to expose the hyper-model parameter, hyper-parameters, rather, of the model, um, you wouldn't want to wait and, and, and put this very, very large investment in GPUs. Right? If you can able to iterate more quickly, that's valuable. And that, that's to just say you could, you could, in fact, do that. Um, I will actually say one, one sort of point here, unpublished point. So, so we're currently trading a, a variant of this model that doesn't rely on multiple sequence alignments. So it's a, a pure single sequence model. Um, and what we're seeing actually in that case, interestingly, <laughs> is that unfortunately it doesn't have this behavior that trains very, very slowly. So, so, so far it's actually doing very well in, in terms of accuracy. It seems to, um, it hasn't saturated and we've been training it for a long time. Um, but it doesn't have this sort of very sharp rise. It seems to go, you know, it seems to learn much more slowly, which is disappointing to us in a way. But, um, but at least, I mean, in so far as our faults concerned anyway, the multiple sequence alignment based method does seem to be able to do this sort of very, very rapid, uh, very rapid acquisition of knowledge. Um, 
another key, another minor point, but, but an important one. So, so the way alpha is trained is there's kind of a two stages. There's an initial stage where the model is trained on smaller proteins, and then it's sort of ex they're expanded, and a bunch of new auxiliary losses are turned on, and then it's trained for even further. And this fine tuning stage is very expensive. It's, it's about 80% of the total compute is this fine tuning stage. Um, but what we observe in our case anyway is that it seems to primarily focus on just resolving physical violations, on essentially not generating things like stereo clashes. Uh, beyond that, uh, the overall accuracy is, 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 less, is little affected. In fact, it actually gets a little bit worse. Um, so that's, again, important from the perspective if you're trying to model, uh, if you're trying to train various variants and trying to understand you know, their behaviors, maybe you don't need to worry about this fine-tuning stage, which, which will cut down, which would cut down compute costs substantially. Um, Okay, so then we start kind of looking into how, how it actually learns as, as, the, as this process is unfolding. Uh, let me see if I could remove the... It's gonna block the, the, the labels, unfortunately, on the bottom. Um, so here on the x-axis, uh, and, and yeah, well, hold on, let me, let me explain figure first. I think if you pop out and pop back into full screen, it might. Let's see, that works. Actually, hold on, I think I know what's going on. <laughs> My computer has this funny thing where it gets stuck. Yep, okay, that's all set. Um, so, right, so, so, so I mentioned earlier that it's self calibrated right? it has a sense of its own accuracy. Um, and so just by, by uh, to orient you, so the color here is gonna encode the, the, the training stage, right? And everything here up to like 5,000, this is that early rise phase. So that, that's what we're going to do. Actually, most of the analysis I'm going to describe is going to be focused on that early, early rise phase. Um, I'm not going to sort of go into the latter phases all that much. Um, so that's what the color is encoding. And then um, on the x-axis here is, again, the, the predicted uh, accuracy of those predictions. Right? So this is its own self-assessment. And the y-axis is, is the actual accuracy. So not surprisingly, right, it starts out poor and it gets better. So that's, 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 that's not surprising. Um, but what isn't a little bit surprising to me is that it actually maintains a pretty decent self-assessment of, of, of how it's doing throughout the process, right? So it isn't like, you know, initially it's sort of poor and then it, then, then it starts doing well and then it, it learns to self-assess. Uh, rather, as it's learning, right, particularly in this kind of key phase here, it is, it is aware of, of its sort of lack of accuracy. Um, and in subsequent variants, now we have new models, this seems to be the case. And so, so this may actually be kind of a useful training signal, essentially, for, for, for itself, that sort of able to use that knowledge to actually improve its own predictions. Um, now, it does this sort of funny thing where it is essentially um, a little bit uh, pessimistic in the beginning and in the middle, and then it's kind of converges to something which is more, which is more accurate. Uh, we don't really know why that pessimism is, is there, but, but, but it, is, it is kind of consistent that we always see it being a bit pessimistic during, during the process. Um, now, as you begin to unpack this, you can also begin, you can ask questions about, well, what, how does it acquire aspects of protein uh, structure, right? In particular, in this case, secondary structure elements, right? Um, and what we, so we, we see a few things. Um, maybe not surprisingly, it learns helices before it learns sheets, right? So helices are sort of more closely, right? More, more local, they're, 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 they don't quite require as much knowledge about the global structure. And, and even though you know, the, the gap is not huge, but it is very discernible, right? That there is that kind of initial rise, and then, and then there's a bit of a delay, and then the, 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 the kind of ability to recover sheets is, um, is, is established. The y-axis here is F1 score, just basically a classification of how well does it pick up uh, the, those secondary structure elements. Um, and, and we can break this up into sort of uh, kind of finer grain um, classes. Um, and, and, uh, so the, the gap remains, but, but there's something interesting additionally here, which is that um, certain classes, for example, poly, proline, proline helices, uh, they're a bit more sort of niche. Um, and what seems to happen is that uh, they, get, they do get eventually learned, not as well as the kind of more dominant classes, um, but, but part of that sort of very long training that, that I said earlier sort of doesn't really do, do you all that much, it's just that last 10%. It's where some of these things begin, begin, get, get learned, right? So, so, so that, that very long training uh, sort of regimen does seem to help in terms of these sort of more, more niche classes. Um, and this is generally sort of correlated with, frequent, with, with their frequency in the PDB, right? So the more dominant uh, classes are learned earlier than the, the less dominant ones. And that's, that's not surprising, but, but it's sort of, um, it, it's, good to see, it's good to see it recovered. Um, Another aspect of this is that it does seem to learn in sort of a multi-scale way. Uh, so what we did here is we, take, we took proteins and we kind of sharded them, sort of cut them up into small pieces. Uh, and then we ask, what is the GDTS, so that's a me measure of accuracy, uh, how, when is good, zero is bad. 
what is the GDTS of these various fragments as a function of training time, right? Um, and so uh, this is a bit subtle, right? So, so you start out essentially all being poor, that's not surprising, and they all end up doing about as well, uh, which is interesting, right? Because it's somewhat length independent, which is, which is surprising, right? Because these things are, you know, this, the, the pink is very long. These are on the average 300, 400 years of proteins. Um, but what's interesting is that, you know, initially you see this sort of large separation, right? Where it seems to have learned the shorter fragments better than the, sh than the longer ones, right? And then there's, there's that kind of uh, fast rise phase where, where they kind of get compressed and it becomes somewhat length independent, right? Uh, and so, so clearly there is, there is a, a sort of a scale, a scale dependency, at least, early on in the training, in the training procedure. Um, and we see this not just in terms of sort of, uh, you know, the length of, of a protein fragment, but also in terms of um, the size of various secondary structure elements. So, so in the helix case, this is just length. So how long is a, is a helix? Um, but in the, in the sheet case, this is how wide these, these sheets are. So how many strands you have in a sheet? Um, and again, similar phenomenon, right? Where at the end, they're essentially all equally well learned. So they're, they're, the model is basically length independent or size independent. Um, but doing the, doing kind of, you know, much of the, 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 the training uh, process, there's actually, you know, very clear separation where it's learned uh, kind of, you know, narrow, I guess, sheets here better than, than, than wider sheets. I don't, for the metrics you're plotting, I don't really know how they intrinsically scale with the size. And like, it's uh, kind of hard to... The, the, yeah. These metrics are, are, are length independent, so, so they, shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't scale with size for the most part. That's obviously an issue in terms of, yes, uh, but, but these methods shouldn't scale with the size. Um, right. And th another thing which was sort of interesting is that it seems to sort of learn essentially in, 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 in a, it seems to learn spatial dimensions as, it, as it's going through the training process. Uh, so let me show you the animation and I'll kind of describe this. So it starts out learning basically what looks like a 1D tube. Um, and then that tube turns into something like a 2D sheet. Maybe it has some curvature. And then that 2D sheet then sort of acquires volumes and becomes a 3D structure. And then you begin to see the secondary structure elements get filled in, right? Um, so just, just to kind of be clear here, so this is, this is predictions made as the model is training from the full pipeline, right? Uh, which is quite distinct from, say, the animations that DeepMind themselves produce, which is a fully trained model, but intermediate predictions as the model is, making, is, is doing this inference, right? These are fully inferred structures, but uh, into, you know, uh, partially trained models. Um, and, and we see this kind of transition, like I said, from 1D to 2D to 3D to, uh, to secondary structure elements. And it's not, you know, I'm not cherry picking here. You see another example, for example, this structure. Again, you see that 1D curve, or something like a curve, um, 2D structure. Again, you have some sort of, um, maybe some curvature there, and then it acquires volume, um, and then finally acquires the actual secondary, the details that acquire, that sort of fill in the, the secondary structure element. Um, and I will say it's not entirely clear to, I mean, we have some hypotheses, and I'll, I'll flesh this out a little bit more, but as, what, what, as to why it learns spatial dimensions in a sort of sequential way is not, is not entirely clear, and it's not, um, they're not, they're not sort of obvious parallels in other kinds of problems where this sort of phenomenon uh, takes place. Uh, but, but it's likely influenced, obviously, by the, by the loss function, which, which sort of, um, uh, which may incentivize the model or drive the model to learn in this way. Um, so coming back to this picture, it's sort of interesting, because I, I didn't mention the GDTS, right? But if you notice, the GDTS is a sort of overall tertiary accuracy. Uh, and you see, you see what I just showed earlier, right, where this actually rises before the secondary structure elements get recovered, right? So, so here you do notice that there's kind of very you know, narrow period of time where the, where the structure is first recovered, the tertiary structure, before the details uh, get filled in. Um, so another way to kind of quantify this, right, is to, is to, um, to look at the 3D structures right, in, just in 3D and look at the principal components in, in you know, just literal space, right? Um, and then ask, you know, what does the mean eigenvalue of the various components? Uh, as a model is training, right? Um, and so initially, you know, it's it starts as a sort of dot, but the key point is that there are these gaps here, right? You know, this gap and then this gap, where it sort of, it, it learns the, the it, you know, it sort of expands in one particular dimension before, uh, before the other dimensions start kicking in, right? And, and, and this, these sort of delays are the things that, that, we're, that we're seeing in those, in those animations, but this is, of course, average now across, you know, the whole, the whole validation set. Um, and, and another way to kind of just sort of illustrate this is um, if, you, if you look at the, so here each PCA is, is colored, or each, each PC rather is colored 
uh, by sort of its maximum, uh, maximal uh, final value. And so initially, you know, they, they, it's all blue, so that just means it's all 1D. And then the kind of the green kicks in, that's the, the second dimension. And then the third dimension kicks in, and then finally you have the full, the full extent of the structures. So yeah. could you relate any of these principal components with the structures, like, uh, I don't know, the alpha axis or something like that? So those c components are just literally the spatial extent of the structure. They're not, they're not some sort of high dimensional reduction of anything. They're just literally, the, 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 in Cartesian space, what is the spatial extent along various dimensions, right? So, so when I say the first species, it just means the longest axis of the protein, right? That, that, that's all, so it's, 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 not a, it's not any kind of dimensionality reduction that's happening here. I'm just using it to orient the structure, so are we able to kind of talk about various axes? Yeah. Um, okay, so, so this, this sort of goes, raises, raises a question. My element is that, is it just about dimensions? Or is there, is, is, can, we, can we say something a bit more? Can we make a slightly stronger statement? And I think, we think we can, which is that it's actually not just learning spatial dimensions sequentially, but it's that essentially learning PCA projections of the structures. Um, so so let, let me try to kind of build a case for this in, um, uh, using the following uh, figures. So, so here what we're looking at is, um, as the model is training, if you look at the mean displacement um, in, in Cartesian space in terms of the, 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 how the atoms are moving, right, as you're making these predictions. Um, and then we're comparing these to the various uh, PCs that we derive from the final 3D structure. Right, so we take the final three structure, we know, we, we know its spatial extent along the, the it, it's just you know, the, the three primary axes. And then we ask, if we go back in the beginning of training or during in the early phases of training and look at how the atoms are moving, where, where, how, the, how are they moving relative to those various axes? Um, and what we see, but it's not, it's not perfect to be sure, is that in this case, for example, most of the movement right, comes in that first principal component, that's what's happening in the blue, and then you have most of the movement in green, and then, the, then finally most of the movement in, in red. Right? Suggesting that, in fact, these are PCA projections. Right? So they're not, they're not just simply 1D, you know, 1D sort of squished versions of, well, um, they're not just simply arbitrary 1D or 2D versions of the structure. They are, in fact, sort of directly, literally kind of squished versions of the final 3D structure. Um, but it's not perfect. And part of the reason, because like, for example, you see this big red spike here, and you see here, you know, these two are quite overlapping, the red and green. Um, but this is at least in part because the, the 2D surfaces are, uh, do show quite a bit of curvature. And, and, and he, PCA obviously is a linear projection scheme. So, so some, some of that uh, additional kind of movement in the, in the third dimension, for example, could come from that, from that curvature. So, so this is actually not specific to protein folding, right? This idea that a learning algorithm would first, you know, fit the dominant signal and wait until it's squeezed all the juice out of that before it can go to the sort of the next dominant piece of the signal. You, you see this very generally in learning algorithms. So in fact, people describe it even as phase transitions and all, you know, it's, it's a well-studied sort of field. So I wonder why is it extra significant here, you think? So, uh, so I'm actually curious if, 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 if the, because we have, we've, we've tried to find um, you know, evidence of this in other places. The key point that just to keep in mind, right, is that this is an algorithm that's trying to learn over an ensemble of proteins, right? It's, it's, it's a half a whole large data set, right? Um, but what, what we're seeing here is that individually, per protein, right, in the, in the literal spatial extent of that protein, we're seeing this recovery, right? So I guess the, the, the equivalent here would be something like, um, you know, in, in a sort of a 2D image, you start recovering, you know, certain colors that that would you know that would that would be the, the kind of the dominant the dominant colors of that image before the you know the most secret. and that as far as I know it doesn't happen in computer vision. Um, so, so, so now there's a, there's a question of how do you map this right? So what what is the right what is the right kind of dimensions that you that you're looking at? Um, but even like in, in, in sort of generative models of like 3D structure, um, um, not 3D structures, but like 3D geometry, geometric objects, as far as I know, we don't see this kind of spatial extent in, in literal Cartesian space, right? This isn't about the projection of like the data in some sort of high dimensional, again, uh, kind of reduction. Maybe a detail, but there's like an overall orientation between the kind of final thing and whatever it is, like how are you, uh, yeah, so what we do, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually a very good te technical later, point, but it's an important point, yeah, because we had to get this guy to make this, to make this analysis work. So what we do is we iteratively, so we start with the final structure, and then we iteratively, we iteratively uh, super align, register, 
you know, the next to last to the last, and then the next to last to last to the next to last, and so on. So that we, we because you're right, doing training is in arbitrary orientations. But we essentially kind of re-register everything to, to map to the initial, uh, sorry, to the final structure, but do it in this kind of sequential next, next neighbor uh, approach so that we, we, we are, um, uh, so that stabilizes the process. Because otherwise, if you, if you try to, for example, register the very first structure to the last one, you'd get very, it's very noisy. Yeah, because all like squished together. But because we do it sequentially, we think we recover. I mean, that's why you see these spikes. But that's part of the problem why this is not very clean. Right, that's part of the issue. It, it's because, in fact, there is, there is all this stochasticity in, in like, how the structure is predict predicted that, that throws some of this analysis off. Um, let's make sure I'm on time. OK. Um, just uh, don't belabor this too much, but, but if you were to look at, so an another way of thinking about this is that if it's with learning these, these uh, dimensions kind of essentially independently, so just learning the structure as, as, as it can, um, you would expect to see sort of, sort of no staggering. Right? If you look at the ma major, uh, so, so sorry, let me check what we're looking at here. So here we, we take the final three structure, we project it into 2D, we project it onto 1D, and then we, we, com we compute the RMSD relative to that final three structure. As, as the model is training. And, and so what we see is, so this is back what I was saying earlier, if there was no staggering, you just sort of learn all three dimensions. And then, of course, you're gonna plateau because the 1D projection will never be as good as the 3D structure. Um, but but you, you would just see them kind of go all together as opposed to this kind of, the alternative, which is a sort of perfect staggering approach where you perfectly learn the 1D before you move on to the 2D and before you move on to the 3D. And that's, that's what we sort of see, right? Where you know, initially they're all sort of overlapping and then there's this kind of, um, 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 split that happens, and then the 1D gets, gets, gets saturated. And then similarly on the 2D case, where they're essentially all uh, being, you know, behaving uh, equivalently before you see the split uh, for, the, for the 3D case. Question? Yeah. So how do these errors look for, so I mean, proteins can have, uh, you know, can be more, more or less round. Yeah. Um, and I guess how does it, how do these trends compare when you look at, like, the maximum difference yeah. between the principal component, like the magnitude of the principal component? Yeah, so well, we don't really see any difference so far. But we do think in part, maybe it goes back to that earlier question, you know, because the, the, the model is trying to learn something general across the whole data set, right? So it might look quite different if we had trained it in a way where we give it, for example, you know, essentially all square, or like all semi-spherical proteins or like very long proteins. Uh, then we might begin to see you know, some, some difference in, in, in behavior. Uh, but we, but that's, I mean, we haven't done that. That's an, it's an expensive experiment to do. But, but it would be interesting to, to look into that because, because that's an obvious question. It's like, do you actually see some differences based on essentially how sort of, uh, lo, you know, how lopsided or, or equally distributed in different, in different spatial dimensions a given protein is? Yeah. Um, okay, let me, let me kind of, uh, yeah, make sure you can see. So, so let me, let me um, maybe I'll, I'll, this is kind of the last set of, uh, major set of analysis I'll describe. Um, so, so another thing we were interested in is, is that, well, how well does a model generalize to, to new protein structures, right? Uh, if, it, if, it, if it hasn't seen them, right? So because, you know, uh, DeepMind went to start training on the, whole, on the whole PDB, so it was, it was a little bit hard to say uh, how well does it really learn, you know, to, 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 to predict structures that, that look very, very different from ones that it's seen. Um, the first set of experiments we did in this case did, didn't even structurally stratify things, but just said, what if we had less data, right? How, how well can we learn if we just randomly split the PDB? Um, so, so the colors here correspond to different reductions of the data set in a random fashion. Uh, and the, the rest of it is the same. IDT is a, is a measure of accuracy. And the step is just how, you know, how long we've trained the model for. And so what's interesting, uh, and I think quite remarkable, so, so, you know, so red is like the, 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 full, the full model, right? And this is, this is a model here that is you know, about 1%, even less than 1% of the full PDB. Right? So this is on the order of about 1,000 proteins that it's been trained on. Um, and the reason why I say it's remarkable, because even though it does worse, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not catastrophically worse, right? In fact, that blue model is more accurate than AlphaFold 1, the, the, the first model that made you know, headlines in, in um, 2018. Uh, which is pretty interesting, and there's a couple of ways to, I think there are a few takeaways from this, right? One takeaway, at least, is that um, essentially AlphaFold 2 is um, so much more sort of efficient, so much more data efficient, that it requires 1% as much data as AlphaFold 1 does, right, to, to, do, to do as well, right? So, so you know, there's always this kind of question, is data versus model? And I think this is a very clear kind of argument that a well-designed model architecture like AlphaFold 2 pays dividends, right? Enormous dividends. 
because it's able to do with one hundredth as much data uh, the same as the, the AlphaFold 1 uh, architecture does. Right? So that, that, that's sort of really interesting. Um, another, which I think is sort of interesting, you know, it's always fun to kind of think, think back about these sort of thought experiments, like what, what would happen if we had all this knowledge, right? And we'd gone back to like 1990 or something, you know, when the PDB was one hundredth the size it is today, and then trained a model. And of course, this is a random split, so it's not quite a fair comparison. But, but, but it, it does raise that possibility, right? That, that you know, if we, we could have done this like decades ago uh, if, if we had the alpha to architecture and of course the GPUs and so on, uh, which, is, which is pretty pretty remarkable. And I think, I mean, okay, so, so coming back maybe to, to the topic of this workshop, I mean, thinking about other molecular systems, right? This obviously is a question, like with the PDB, you have 200,000 structures, but if, what are, are there other systems where we have a lot fewer Fewer structure, just less data in general. You know, does this suggest that there are there is sort of low hanging fruit, or at least high hanging fruit, but still, but still kind of you know fruit that we can we can reach to? <laughs> um, so this is a random split, but but of course proteins aren't random. Right? They 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 evolve evolutionarily, and there there's kind of relationships between different protein uh, fault families. Um, and one 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 place where they where this has been formalized is this CAF classification, where they essentially kind of been split up hierarchically into uh, groups of sort of increasing levels of, of generality, right? Topology being the lowest, so this is kind of you know almost like a homologous family, uh, all the way up to class, which is really broad and essentially you know groups things into in terms of whether they're mainly heli uh, mainly helical, mainly sheet, or some sort of mixture of the two. Right? So they are very very large groups. Uh, like, like at the class level, is basically just three groups. <laughs> uh, at the topology level, I think is maybe 200, and I think on the architecture level is 42. So that gives you a sense of, you know, across the whole PDB, right? So this gives you a level of the of the granularity. Um, so we start out with topology, right? So, so just to be clear, so what we did here is we took the, the PDB, we now stratified it, right? we clustered it so that different you know, different structural families at these levels of the hierarchy are are separated, and then we ask how well do we do? Right? If we train on, on a subset and then test on, on, the, on the rest, right? Uh, and again, color coding gives you the, the fraction, of, the fraction of, of clusters now, not, not, not proteins, not, not sequences. Um, so again, what's really interesting here is that you go down to 5% of the topology level, which is a pretty, pretty severe restriction. Right? So we only have 5% of, of the topologies in the PDB, and then we're testing, uh, uh, we're, we're assessing generalizability of the remaining 95, and again, this is a model that is sort of comparable, I would say, to the first alpha fold one. Right? Maybe a little bit worse, but but not but not catastrophically worse. Um, remarkably, same thing holds on, on architectures, right? So 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 at this level, we're talking about I think the five percent corresponds to like two or three architectures, right? And then we're testing on you know thirty eight architectures, so it's, it's a big split in terms of the, the, the structural space. Um, and again, it, it's you know, large speaking, not 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 too bad. Um, and this, I think, this is the one that completely blew my mind. So here we train on something, right, which is essentially all alpha helical, and then we test on beta sheet proteins, right? Um, and then we do the reverse. And again, there is a definitive uh, drop in accuracy, but it's not catastrophic, which, which I, was, I was expecting this to be like way down here, right? So the fact that it could do this is really pretty cool. And just, again, kind of speaks to how well it can generalize. Now, it does something funny, so let me, let me show you a couple of examples. So, so the, the orange are the, the real structures. The top one is a model that's trained on the alpha helical proteins. And so it, you know, it gets the alpha helical structure well. Um, and it sort of, it, it obviously starts getting quite confused, start putting in you know, strands where it's not supposed to. Uh, but actually most of the, you know, some of the helical structure actually is reasonably well recovered. Um, and then here is the opposite, right, where it's a beta dominated uh, protein. Uh, so, so, sorry, just to be clear. So, so this is trained on alpha helices, tested on a alpha helical protein. This is trained on beta sheet proteins and tested on alpha, on, 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 on alpha helical protein. And here it's trained on, on beta sheet, sheet proteins. So it recovers the, the beta sheet uh, protein well. Um, and this one, the alpha helical protein, it, it, it sort of puts things in the right place, right? It's not getting the alpha helices anymore. So it's just giving you some, something of a, a bit of a loopy, a loopy structure. But, but the atoms are roughly in the right place, right? So it sort of kind of learns that this is what things are to be, even though it doesn't really understand the secondary structure aspects of it, which is pretty cool. But just to make sure it's classification, even things that have are mainly beta, you are going to see some helices. So it's not like it's never seen helices. It's, it's even a couple of percentage points. Okay. Yeah, so it's like two, three percentage points. So it sees a bit. Yes, you're right. Does it mean that it learns some sort of a potential? Does it, sorry? Does it learn some sort of scoring function, potential energy? It, it does. So, so that, that's something which, 
It wasn't was really part of our work, but, but uh, Sigaf Chernikov, he has a really nice paper on this. AlphaFold is, is an energy model. The, exactly, like it's a good decoy ranking function, essentially. And, and it does seem to, to like beat Rosetta and those kinds of you know, force field type of approaches in terms of ranking different structures. So it, yes, it does seem to learn something like an implicit uh, physical energy function. Um, and back when you were asking me about the, you know, those outliers, um, what, what, what you typically see, right, is that if you have a very deep multiple sequence alignment, uh, alpha doesn't rely on sort of its implicit f scoring function very much. So, so it, it's, much of the information is in the evolutionary kind of record, and just the structure snaps into place right away. But when the MSA is very shallow, that's when it leans more heavily on that scoring function. And that's when you start seeing the stochasticity more. Because sometimes it sort of happens to land into the right place and finds the structure, and sometimes it does not. And you need to do more sampling to actually do well. Um, and in fact, in the last cast, in cast 15, uh, one of the best groups for, for assembling complexes, what, what that group did basically was generate something like 50,000 uh, awful runs per complex, which was an enormous amount of compute. <laughs> like, like really, you know, it's like thousands of dollars per, per complex. Um, but showed that you could actually recover um, structures that you could never do with just a single, you know, single run. So, so it's, the, the notion of sampling is definitely sort of implicitly there. Um, the, the, I think this is the last couple of slides. So, you know, we, we asked this question whether the kind of the, the spatial aspect, the, the spatial extent aspect, uh, is also present at the level of, of topology and, and, and architecture, right? So, so is it maybe learning uh, sort of local aspects of structure, but not so much global aspects of structure? Um, and I think I think there is some argument to be, to be made that that's in fact happening. So. Uh, so again, these are fragment lengths, so how big is, is, a, is a chunk of a protein that you're looking at, and this is a fraction of, of the data used, right? And so what you see is that when you use all the data, you know, the, the gap shrinks, right? While when you use less data, there's a bigger gap, suggesting that in fact, um, when, when it has limited data, you know, it's mostly learning kind of the local aspects of structure, and that what you really need more data for is kind of the more global aspects of structure. Um, and we see that similarly with the architecture splits, where again, this, there's a sort of differential gap between the, um, the, the sort of low data regime and the, and the kind of more high data regime where it begins to saturate. Um, I'll skip this, is not so critical. I, I'll, well, I was, the, the, you know, we did the trick in the, in the training procedure where we slightly modified the loss function, and we actually got, uh, this is the new clamping protocol, where we got the model to train much more stably. This is a technical detail, but we think we've, we've improved the, the, the stability of the training, which is kind of a, Something to be proud of, given that DeepMind designed this. Um, so, all right. So, so, so just last, last thing. So, we, we, you know, this whole open fold thing, what we're trying to do now is essentially turn this really into something like an academic industry consortium, where it becomes a platform for doing mach machine learned kind of biomolecular modeling. Right? So, there's all these things that we're interested in that I talked about earlier that we can't do right now, um, like single sequence prediction, like incorporating experimental data. That's, that's a sort of a pain point for a lot of people. Right? If, you, if you're a cryo-EM person, you have all this knowledge, you have all this prior information, you want to you integrate it into the prediction, and you can't right now. Um, and certainly things like protein-small molecule interactions, protein design, and so on. So um, yeah, I, I, so, so hopefully this will be useful. Uh, I think it, it, it is uh, being used by others, so I think it, it is proving to be useful, but, but obviously only time will, will tell. Uh, so, so we shall see. Um, yeah, thanks for your attention. Those are the folks who, who, um, who did the work. Certainly Gustav was the person who sort of led the, the bulk of the effort uh, on this front and other people on the kind of the organizing side. Uh, and this is my lab. Thanks for your attention.